Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson, and I am joined by the man with the angelic voice. He is Mr. Papa Smokes. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Munson. How are all my wrestling people doing out there? Well, we know that they had a hell of a time on Saturday night because we finally got to see them live and in person with PPW Presents Part 5, A New Beginning, and we're going to talk very much about that show coming up here right away on this episode of ring respect radio before we get into the show today we want to go ahead and ask you to hit the subscribe button down below turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release new material right here on the video bros network also we want to give a shout out to our friends at backbreaker media and the canadian wrestling network as well too have been big supporters of ring respect radio and i believe this is the month where mike is doing a fundraiser over at backbreaker media and stuff like that to uh, help with uh, children with a men- uh, mental health problems and stuff like that and creating awareness for it. So go check out all the work that Mike is doing here for Backbreaker Media. And also, if you can, support the cause this month. Uh, so big things there. Thank you, Mike, for everything you do. Uh, so, yeah, um, going back to our show here today, Papa Smokes, we're talking about PPW Part 5, A New Beginning. And as you can see, I'm not very mobile at the moment. <laughs> And this occurred as a result of the poor management at Prairie Pro Wrestling that occurred during this show. I found it chaotic at best. We are going to talk about the matches, which were good and fun to see live, but they put me in dire risk. They put me up there to light a sparkler of sorts. I was asked to light a sparkler in a gimmick battle royal. And this cosplay, no good for nothing, Kane comes walking on out. And without any warning, I've got this son of a bitch's hand across my million dollar throat. And this guy is grabbing and pinching and squeezing the life out of me. I barely got out of this thing with my life. And I still, I still put in the time to record the rest of that show, Papa Smokes. And then I went to the doctor immediately after. And they said, there is all sorts of whiplash and injury problems to my poor neck here. And I believe the next time around, PPW management, maybe in particular, their very own senior executive director of talent relations and operations, Crash Crimson, owes yours truly a true apology. Wow, yeah, that's quite the situation. Of course I was there. I had a ringside seat for the incident, shall we say. And uh, I saw you go down after the uh, after the uh, alleged throat grab occurred. I don't think it's alleged. We, we have it on video, but uh, yeah, yeah, it looked like uh, you were in some distress there, Munson. I saw you afterwards. You could hardly talk, and uh, what a what a shabazz this has been. What a what a what an incident this is, and uh, I can see why you're pissed off. Yeah, you bet. I've been talking to the lawyers. We're going to get things written up and taken care of. And you know what? I will firmly accept an apology from PPW management. If they bring me an apology, I will go back to my normal duties for PPW. No questions asked. So that's all I'm asking PPW management is an apology for putting me at risk. But how about the show? Hey, let's get to a positive note. We don't come here just to talk shit all the time. We come here to have some fun in PPW part five, a new beginning. First of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the over 170 fans in attendance that packed the Cosmo Senior Center and over, I believe it was 130 or 140 pre-sale tickets that were sold. The most pre-sales we've had for a PPW show so far. This put our faith back and put doing shows after 19 long months. It was great to see many of the people that we know and love that come to the show all the time. And generally, I think everybody there had an amazing time, Papa Smokes. What were your thoughts? Hi. First of all, I had an amazing time there. I'm still basking in the glow and the ecstasy of of being back at PPW live wrestling shows. It was like a blur. I I was just having such a good time, even though uh, you and I were both working there and everything, just to watch that and be around the the boys again to be around all our great fans again was awesome and uh, didn't that turn into a great card too they had it laid out they had it all set out and uh, our fans were loud vocal and very very happy when this was done they sure were so let's talk about some matches from that night because you know what it was exactly in april of 2020 which is going to lead us into our segment after this that we 
did an episode of Ring Respect Radio, the first time that we officially did this version of Ring Respect Radio that we do now on a regular basis. And on that show, we talked about Four Rounds to the Crown, the final show we did before the shutdown. And so today is going to lead into another topic from that exact show. But again, we talked about that one on here. And today we're going to talk about part five, A New Beginning. Uh, the opening match, Levi Knight taking on Cannibal Kelly, who was there with uh, his sidekick, his partner in crime, Johnny Two Fingers. And uh, Levi Knight surprisingly coming out to a, a resounding boo from the PPW Nation this time around. We, this guy was a fun-loving fan favorite before, and he came out to people just hating on him here tonight. I don't know where the turn came about, why the fans have turned on Levi Knight, but he sure was taking it from the crowd that night. But man, he gave it back to them in stride, and he uh, put on a hell of a match there with Cannonball Kelly. But man, disaster as this one came to a close. Uh, Levi Knight brought the chair in with intent that he was going to hit Cannonball Kelly. Johnny Two Fingers came in, tried to take that chair away. Levi Knight turned around, smashing Johnny Two Fingers right across the head with that chair, knocking him completely out. Poor guy has probably got concussion problems. Uh, he came out bandaged later in the evening and stuff like that. So we know he took one hell of a lick there from that chair. And then Cannonball Kelly took revenge on Levi Knight, hitting him with the chair and Levi Knight picking up his first PPW win, albeit in disqualification fashion. But man, chaos ensued in that matchup. And what a way to kick off. Fans were hot for it. Bob Smokes, your take on that particular match. Well, the last time we had seen Levi Knight, he came out to uh, quite a lot of cheering and uh, he was popular. You know, he has that cool Rick James entrance song and he, he does a He has a cool outfit and he does his dance and stuff. And people have been into it before, but. I guess I think the difference was this time as he was up against uh, the perennial favorite around here, Cannonball Kelly, or one of the big favorites anyway. And I think uh, the fans just weren't having uh, him over Cannonball Kelly. I think that was part of uh, how the fans were feeling about that. But another great showing by Levi Knight. And uh, I think this kid's got a future to him. He hasn't, like you say, he hasn't been winning much in PPW yet. He did get a DQ win the other night and, uh, I think the sky's the limit for this guy as far as uh, Prairie Pro Wrestling goes. Yes, you bet. And up next, it was another interesting matchup. We had the uh, most intelligent or smartest man, sorry, in professional wrestling today. Bucky McGraw came out, cut a promo, and his match for the evening was against Sean Moore. This is a guy I wanted to say I wish would be in a PPW ring sometime, Papa Smokes. And sure enough, at part five, a new beginning, Sean Moore making his Prairie Pro Wrestling debut. Very excited to see Sean Moore. We, uh, all, of course, called matches of his in the past. Wonderful human being, great athletic individual, and he gave Bucky one hell of a match. But again, Bucky McGraw doing anything he can to pick up a victory and managing to use that re-education booklet that has helped him through so many matches as of late, once again, to pick up a sneaky victory, but continue this dominating streak that, Bucky McGraw has gone on. He is on one hell of a tear right now, and I don't see it ending anytime soon. Yeah, and uh, Bucky McGraw, we saw that he had changed his uh, outlook a little bit once uh, he started appearing for PPW. He had the uh, Golden Path to Enlightenment book. He had a whole new mindset, a whole new way of thinking, and uh, his wrestling had changed a little bit too, but... Uh, he, uh, he's been on one hell of a tear in PPW. I don't think he's even lost yet. And this is one guy, when you talk about handing out that nice, shiny gold PPW belt, Bucky McGraw's got to be one of the top contenders to get that belt. He really does. So uh, from there, our third match of the evening, we had Rocket Shoes, Tony Novak taking on Joey Vendetta. And again, this is Joey Vendetta's second outing in a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring. Tony Novak, who has been there from day one with us since the Food Truck Wars day and that Lethal Lottery tournament, has had quite a run in PPW. Uh, again, some victories, some losses, but again, more on the victory side than loss side. We've seen Tony Novak come from a, a, a fan in the audience once upon a time. We saw him taken out of there and beaten down in a wrestling ring to this really over fan favorite here in Prairie Pro Wrestling. He got one of the most massive pops, I would say, of the entire night. People were really behind him. Uh, this had to be probably one of my favorite Tony Novak matches so far. He's really shown that he's been working on himself. He's been working on his in-ring ability during this time of shutdown and everything like that. 
And again, Joey Vendetta is a seasoned professional. He gave Tony Novak one hell of a match, but man, Tony Novak coming up with another victory, looking strong. And again, he's going to be a, one that carries on in the contendership for the Prairie Pro Wrestling Championship. I mean, with the momentum of the fans behind him, there is that slim possibility that Tony Novak could surprise and end up towards the final. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd even be surprised if Tony Novak was in the final. Uh, like you said, he comes out to that massive pop in Saskatoon. The fans love him. He's a perfect baby face. He, they, they love to love him. He's got some high-flying moves. He's got pretty good uh, basics and fundamentals in the ring as far as ch uh, chain wrestling goes. And uh, he looks good. He's a huge favorite. And uh, that I wouldn't even be surprised if he's around for uh, when the belt is handed out at the, at, the end of, uh, at the end of this tournament when the champion is crowned. Oh, for sure he will be. So, Up next, uh, match number four of the night. And man, this was a massive one. We had El Asesino taking on Michael Allen Richard Clark. And damn it, this was the kind of match we needed for this evening. This was two very seasoned professionals inside that ring. Two great wrestlers. Two completely contrasting styles at the same time. You've got El Asesino, who is downright dirty. And, you know, he'll try anything in order to pick up a victory. But he's tough. And he will beat beat you down hard but michael allen richard clark is not an easy man to beat down he has got a lot of energy great wrestling skill great mat skill the fans he's got the momentum there everybody loves michael allen richard clark and so this match ended up being quite a solid encounter between the two of them uh there was that spike i couldn't believe this Bob was folks when michael allen grabbed el asesino's head to drive it into the table and broke the tail in half that guy has got such power behind him he took asesino's head and busted it right through a table and that was the table spot of that matchup holy shit that was insane uh michael allen picking up a well-deserved victory in this matchup again very good for Michael Allen, who continues to be undefeated in Prairie Pro Wrestling. Al Asesino, who has been extremely so strong there as well, too. These are easily two of the top contenders in Prairie Pro Wrestling. Yeah, and this could have been a main event in, in many buildings across Western Canada. These two have uh, carved names for themselves throughout the various wrestling feds, especially in, in Saskatchewan and uh and to have a match like this in the middle of the card on PPW was just a huge treat for the fans. It's, it's the ultimate uh, good versus evil in our Federation PPW. And uh, El Asesino, we all, we all know what he's like. He, he's a master of trickery. He's going he's gonna to pull one over on you somehow. But the power of uh, Michael Allen, Richard Clark, and, and the, the energy of the fans that he has behind him is just almost unstoppable. And uh, yeah, that table shot was in, absolutely insane. It was right beside me while I was working the camera there. And I thought, oh yeah, there'll be a good thump here when uh, Asasino's head goes off that table and just crack right in half. Uh, I'm not sure if Michael Allen, Richard Clark realizes how strong he is. Uh, if you look at him, you can see that he's been working out hard over the past couple of years and is particularly the last year. But yeah, that's a lot of shoulder strength to put a guy's head right through a wooden table like that. Quite impressive. Very impressive. Great matchup. Uh, so the next match we had on this card, we had the Danger Zone, Mitch Clark taking on Davey O'Doyle. Uh, this one being, you know, a fan favorite versus a fan favorite, or at least it seemed that way a uh, great competitive matchup between the two man mitch clark uh, his mat grappling and everything like that a lot of improvement to his game that i like to see i really think that there's a lot of development there again it's hard to keep davy o'doyle down because he's such a strong son of a bitch and he keeps that momentum going and that endurance going and stuff like that and that's what drives him in these matchups uh, he was able to edge out the victory over mitch clark but when davy o'doyle went to shake hands with mitch clark afterwards Mitch Clark wasn't having it, man. He pushed him back. I see an edgier side of Mitch Clark coming forth, and this could be the danger that we've been talking about for a while. Mitch Clark has this fun, happy side that we see time and time again. He's such a fun-loving, happy guy, uh, making jokes and making everybody smile and laugh. Suddenly, he's taking his game seriously. I think he realizes what he needs to do in order to get shot right to the top of Prairie Pro Wrestling, and that is take himself more seriously in the ring. You can't always be smiling and shaking the hands of the fans at ringside. Sometimes you got to get your shit together and get the job done, and I think Mitch Clark realized that, and I think we might see a more aggressive, newer side to Mitch Clark next time around. 
I think you're right about that, Bob. And uh, this was an interesting match too, in that it was such a styles clash. Um, uh, Davy O'Doyle strong on his feet, lot, likes to do a lot of strikes, lot, likes to do a lot of uh, smashes into the corner, a lot of moves off the ropes, off the ropes that involve running and such like that. Mitch Clark, more of a wrestler, wrestler. He uses all kinds of jujitsu, all kinds of catch wrestling. And uh, we saw some nice holds and some nice reversals and everything. He had Doyle's head spinning for a while there with the speed and, and technical ability that he had there. But hence the frustration after the match, I think, because uh, Danger Zone Clark gave it a good run and still uh, took the loss to uh, Davey O'Doyle and just, as you said, not pleased about it at all. Didn't uh, have the good feelings after that match. Didn't want to shake hands. Uh, didn't respond to any uh, crowd noise for him or anything. And I wonder what's on his mind too. Obviously some frustration is brewing within him and we'll have to see how that manifests itself on future PPW dates. You bet we will. Um, so last but not least, or maybe least, uh, it's, it's not our cup of tea, but again, it was Halloween time. The fans were back. We needed to give them a little bit more, especially with the uh, guys that we had available and stuff like that. There was a gimmick battle royal. Guys came out as their favorite wrestlers. Battle royals are kind of fun, interesting. Everyone did some spots that really popped the crowd. Maybe not our cup of tea, but there was some highlights from it. I mean, I gotta say, love Phil Deadly. <laughs> I just, I think this guy is just awesome in every way. He's such a nice dude. He gets in there, does whatever he can to entertain everybody. He is that undercard guy that we love to promote here on bring respect radio and you know what i think with that said we need to invite phil deadly on a future episode of ring respect radio coming up here and just have a good chat with him he's such a great dude and i think he'd fit in well here with us that's a fine idea i think we should work on that one for sure months and uh but about the battle royal too yeah like you say it's not everybody's cup of tea to have uh to have the local stars dressing up as their favorite wrestlers and such. Yeah, it's, it's not up my alley, but I'll tell you what, same thing. Like what you said, the fans love this. It popped the fans. It was a little bit of fun for Halloween and, and, you know, we can have a little bit of fun, can't we? And if I'm to uh, point out anyone that I thought uh, was really uh, great in this match, there were a few people that were great in it. I love Michael Allen, Richard Clark's keen, he looked uh, quite a lot like him, but uh, I thought uh, one of the standouts as far as, as playing his character, the character that he was playing was uh, was Joey Vendetta playing yeah. Luke Harper. Yeah. That, that looked good, man. He had all his moves down pat. He, he, you could tell he was invested <clears throat> in doing a good job of his imitation, and uh, that looked really good. I, I thought he did a great job. See, Vendetta doesn't look like he had to dress up other than changing what clothes he was yeah. wearing because Vendetta yeah. kind of has that Brody Lee, Luke Harper type look to him as it is. You put him in a pair of jeans and a white beater or whatever like Luke Harper used to wear. And yeah, he fit the role perfectly. And I, I heard that from a lot of the PPW Nation afterwards as well too, that Vendetta should just change his gimmick up to being a, a version of Luke Harper now. Now, I don't think that's exactly right to do, but I think they were just trying to make a point about how well it stood out and everything like that that they were pleased to see what vendetta brought to the table in there and i guess for a lot of fans too it's you know it's not that far removed from Brody lee's passing and to be able to some see someone pay homage to him like that i guess was very touching for the fans on hand as well too so you know i mean great job by joey vendetta in doing that and uh glad that you brought that one up too yeah yeah good stuff and just wow just a great feeling that night it, the one of the things I liked the best about that evening uh, with uh, part five, a new beginning was uh, just getting a chance to see, as I always say, all my wrestling people, I got to see them all that night. Uh, I got to see um, the fans, the talent, the staff of BPW, the promoters, the management, everybody. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of these people in a full on year and a half or more. So uh, same thing with you, I'm sure. So yeah. some nice reunions going on there, a lot of hugs, a lot of smiles. It's just a good feeling all around. And it's the way that uh, wrestling can bring people together into a community of of uh, folks that like the same thing, that, that like to go to wrestling shows. And uh, 
man, I, I'm still basking in the feeling of it uh, almost a week later. It was a great thing. I, I can't wait to get going. I want to get the wheels wheels going again so that we can uh, put on more shows, get a champion in our league and get some uh, angles going and get some uh, feuds going and, and, and uh, keep booking all that great talent and keep welcoming all the fun fans in. And it's going to be a wild ride. Yeah, we're, you know, two days into the work week already. And in my day job, nobody stopped talking about it. There was two guys that were present that worked there with me and one of my customers that showed up to the show as well, too. He's an owner of company that we work with and everything. And they loved it. And they've been telling everybody else about it. So, of course, now the buzz is going around the office. Uh, There was even mentioned that my boss was saying that they should make it an entire work outing to come to a PPW show and invite everybody that I work with. So we're talking, I mean, if they bring family, friends and stuff, we're talking, we could have 60, 70, 80 people just from my work that would end up showing up. We might end up having to get a new arena sometime soon, Pop Smokes. Yeah, that, that's been a thought for a long time, even before the COVID shutdown, is that I love uh, the venue that we're in, and I think uh, PPW management also likes it there a lot. It works very well. It's right off Broadway. It's very central in Saskatoon. Easy for everybody to get to. There's parking. There's no problems of, of any kind there. It, the only problem being that we're packing the place so much that it you can't help but think that uh, more people could fit in there. So I know uh, there have been a few discussions and, and you know about this uh, amongst PPW management that we might need a bigger venue and uh, for any special show we might throw, we would have to uh, get one. But uh, yeah, I, I know it's in, I know it's been discussed a few times. We'll see what happens. You bet, man. So moving off of the Prairie Pro Wrestling Part 5, A New Beginning, and tying into our first topic of the night. Our first topic, we're going to go back to that first show of April 2020 that we did at Ring Respect Radio, where we did a bit of a fantasy booking. Who would we like to see come to Prairie Pro Wrestling, whether it was a one-off or whether a run with the company? We each picked five people, and we're going to go back over who we had picked, kind of say what may have been been up to since we had that show happen, Uh, maybe what the possibility of them doing ppw anytime soon might be and then we're going to go and we're going to move on from there to picking five count them five brand new people on the list here today so uh yeah first of all we started off this was your number one pick from the last show pop smokes and that was leo london and an excellent pick i would still say very very capable of coming to a pro wrestling ring at some point in time but man, what a change in style and character from the once gentleman Leo London to now this uh, based on, I guess, the My Chemical Romance Black Parade era uh, style music, that emo style music and stuff like that. Uh, I love the look of what he's done. He's really got that Black, black Parade uh, look nailed down, just packed. And I believe this ties into his personal taste as well, too, which will bode well for him character wise inside that ring and i hope that he still continues he's got such a great in-ring style that i hope that continues along with it and we'll get to eventually see that in a prairie pro wrestling ring as well yeah yeah and uh to update everything i know that he's been active i know that he's done a few shows since everything has opened up uh, out in alberta yeah. and uh we haven't had room to put him on uh, ppw quite yet but i know that's been discussed there's a lot of people that want to get booked with PPW, so it's tough to fit everybody in sometimes. But uh, uh, I stand by that pick to this day, and I, I would welcome Leo London on a PPW card. I really hope it happens soon. I agree with you, man. Uh, my pick from last time was Bobby Sharp, number one pick. And let's, uh, let's just say we don't know what the status could be. Bobby Sharp underwent hip surgery uh, in the last year and stuff like that. So he's still recovering from hip surgery that was uh, well needed. Um, whether or not he's going to get back to being in the ring actively full time, whether or not he's going to have time for Perry Pro Wrestling, it's hard to say. I uh, can't really make that prediction. Would still love if there was even an opportunity one time. He's such a badass heel. I like this guy. I like his in ring work. I think there's so much that could be done with him in a Perry Pro Wrestling ring. And I uh, hope for the speed of recovery as well, too. Yeah, and best wishes for me also. Uh, yeah, and the previous uh, federation that you and I worked for uh, featured Bobby Sharp as as a main event heel quite often, and uh, 
uh, I'm also a great admirer of his work. Uh, he got nuclear heat for uh, for some shows that weren't even uh, very well attended sometimes, but he got everyone booing and yelling and catcalling and everything. And uh, he's awesome on the mic. He's got a great physique. Uh, he's a he's an excellent wrestler and everything. He's got all the pieces that would be perfect for uh, making a run in in PPW. I really hope it happens. Yeah, I hope that that pun with cat calling was intentional on that one there, Pop Smoke. Yeah, <laughs> now it is. Yeah. Um, from there, we went to the number two pick, and I'm going to let you talk a little bit more in depth about this one. And if uh, if you need, I can fill in on what he's done more recently. But uh, you had Zicky Dice. Yeah, yeah. I had seen uh, Zicky Dice uh, debut for NWA when they were first getting going. And uh, yeah, again, he's a wrestler. It's not totally my cup of tea but i think the guy does it well um just a brash obnoxious heel he's wearing pink leather jackets and zippers and and has dyed blonde hair he's kind of a throwback heel to the 80s with the dyed blonde hair and the and the black beard and everything and uh to me this is kind of like uh yeah like a throwback to the 80s kind of guy and uh he, he knows how to build heat. He's a pretty decent wrestler, but he's even better at uh, getting heat from the audience. And uh, I thought he would be a, a nice addition to a PPW card. And, uh, but I need some help. I, I haven't h- heard a whole ton about him um, throughout COVID or, or since uh, places have been reopened. Do you have any info on him? Well, I do. Um, we did see him a little bit with the NWA when they were doing the crossover with, uh, I believe, UWF or primetime wrestling there. Uh, he was yeah. still there actively at that point, but then he had some differences with Billy Corgan, left the NWA. We did see him at the Battle Riot 3 for MLW. He made an appearance right. there. Uh, he has also appeared for AEW a couple times and also has made an official signing with Impact Wrestling as well, too. So Zicky, I think at this point in his career, might be a little further off obtainable than he was when we first came up with this plan, especially with a signing to Impact but not impossible. I mean, again, these aren't contracts that keep them locked. They're like a WWE contract. So again, I can't say that there's no possibility if Zicky was doing a tour that we wouldn't have the ability to give a call to his management team and try to find out what it costs to book the guy if it was reasonable kind of thing. So, I mean, we can dream, right? Absolutely. Uh, next, I had a pick. Uh, this guy was from New Zealand, Jamie Tagatanasi. Um, he was a uh, champion at the time that I picked him. He is now the SPW New Zealand champion, which is one of the top prizes in all of New Zealand right now. He's been tearing it up there as the champion for about a year. So this guy is a continued push to the main event over in the New Zealand scene. He's a Samoan. He's an absolute beast. And I think somebody needs to get on signing him because or he needs to get his ass over to Canada so that we can get him on a tour here and put him in a PPW ring. I think this guy is great. I would love to see him come in and maybe take on someone like an El Asesino or something like that, that because I think the two of them would just shred each other apart. I, I think there's a lot that could be said about what this guy could do inside a PPW ring. And I enjoy his work. I think there's great work coming out of this guy. I think he's going to be a star if he continues to push. And once he gets that ability to kind of travel out of New Zealand, which hasn't been a possibility during COVID times. So I think the best is yet to come from this guy. Okay, great. Uh, You're definitely more familiar with him than I am. I know I've seen a match or two, but um, I know you were covering the Australian and New Zealand scene when you were working for uh, writing for that website for a while there. So um, I'll take your word on that. And and, uh, I would gladly welcome him here. For sure. Uh, up next was your next pick, and we'll let you talk a little bit about this. Um, she's under a new name now, so anybody <clears> watching <throat> might be more familiar with Persia Parada. But uh, Pop Smokes, you picked Steph DeLander last time around, and quite clearly uh, might be quite difficult to get her on a booking now that she's locked into an NXT contract. But damn, would that be a great pick? And I've been uh, watching over in NXT since she made her debut over there. She looks more of a star than... 90% of the women on WWE right now, period, or even on AEW for that matter, they could push this girl to the moon. I mean, she's excellent and what a pick. And I wish she would have been more obtainable for us. Yeah. Yeah. That's another tough one too, because she's been in Australia all this time until she got uh, 
signed with NXT and now she's in Florida, of course. Uh, but what a fun thing it has been from, from uh, fairly humble beginnings to watch her uh, get big in, in Australia. And then she had been, uh, she had had a look from NXT a couple of years ago, which didn't really turn out. But when, <coughs> excuse me, but when her friend Indy Hartwell got signed there, then they took another look at Steph and ended up signing her. And, and now she's got a new gimmick, a new name, and she's on TV. And are they the NXT ladies tag team champions? Or they came up a little bit short, Toxic okay. Shock or whatever their names are, ended up winning. Um I think there's a lot to be said about having them as a tag team too, because they know each other so well. And I really kind of was rooting for Indy and Persia, to be honest, uh, mostly because of Persia. Like Indy's good. I don't, I don't have a problem with Indy. She's done some really silly stuff over in NXT that they forced her into. that I wasn't a big fan of personally, but when she gets down to the wrestling, she can be good. But Steph Delander, AKA Persia Parada is better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And uh, she's one of those wrestlers that because of all the work she's done in the background, i.e. weightlifting, she's already over. I mean, she's a big girl. She's six feet tall. She's got the big quads. She's got all kinds of muscles and everything. She looks awesome in her outfits. So, I mean, when you're that much bigger than a lot of your opponents, it, it makes you more over. It makes you more of a character and more of a threat and, and more of a strong opponent for uh, anyone she might face in NXT. So, I mean, a lot of her hard work is out of the way. She doesn't have to try so hard to get over like some of the smaller people do. She's got the legs, she's got the shoulders and the body. She's massive. So, I mean, like she can do uh, all kinds of moves. She has that death adder finishing maneuver. That's kind of like a, uh, sort of a form of an F5 in a way. And uh, she, she's been flinging some girls around in NXT. And it's good to see. And uh, I, of course, I, I don't know her, but I'm proud of her just to have been watching uh, on social media all this time as I, I take interest in some younger wrestlers sometimes. And Steph was one of them. I, I'm just very proud and very glad to see her doing well, uh, trying to live out her dream in, in WWE. You bet, man. Uh, my next pick that we had was Giselle Shaw, someone who we've called Matt. Uh, I'm trying to think. No, we didn't ever get the chance to call a match of Giselle Shaw's, uh, but we did kind of uh, work for the company that she was in prior to her leaving to the U.S. Um, what a great talent she is. And since the COVID uh, shutdowns and stuff, she's been touring the freaking world still. And she is currently, let me see if I can even turn my neck enough to read this. She is the Rev Pro Undisputed. British women's champion, progress women's champion, and the fierce females champion. This woman has won three belts and is ruling the world right now, kicking ass everywhere she goes. I, I, I fear she's probably too busy to even take PPW's call at the moment, but damn, what a talent she would be. And a lot of uh, great wrestlers in the area that would probably love the opportunity to step in a ring with Giselle Shaw. Absolutely. And we've seen a whole ton of her matches. Um, around here, um, it's sometimes hard. There's not a lot of uh, female wrestlers kicking around Saskatchewan or even Western Canada for that much. Uh, not to uh, not to say anything against the ones there are, but there's just not that many of them. So she had to uh, wrestle men a lot of the time and all that stuff. But she's a tremendous talent. Um, we've also watched her on social media through over the past few years. One thing I've always wondered about her is that she's very much a road wrestler. She's always on the road. Like you said, she's been in the UK recently. I've seen some of her stuff from Japan. She's been all over Europe. She's been all over the States. Now, I'm not an expert in this matter, but it, it strikes me that I always thought maybe if Giselle chose a company and settled down a little bit and stayed there, uh, she might get a little bit further, get a bit more... Um, uh, eyes upon her through uh, uh, just staying in one federation for a little bit. Um, it almost seems like she spreads herself thin by going all around the world, which of course is a good thing because you're going to work with lots of different workers and learn lots of different styles. And, and of course, uh, on the personal level, it's it's fun to uh, to live in different cultures and stuff like that too. But I always thought, well, why doesn't she settle in with Impact or why doesn't she go to 
NWA or why doesn't she go to ROH women's division? I, I'm sure they would have her in those places, but uh, she seems to uh, not want to settle down in any one area. So that that's completely up to her. She's doing great. As you say, she's got gold around her waist a couple times over and uh, I'd love to have Giselle Shaw back. Can you imagine a nice match between Giselle Shaw and Zoe Sager? That would be pretty yeah. good. It would be. And I'd be uh, wrong if I didn't mention it, Pop Smokes. You said about the Ring of Honor women's division. I don't know if you heard the news, but Ring of Honor yeah. is suspending operations yeah. until further notice. This is actually uh, pretty sad news for all the people working in Ring of Honor who are going to be out of contract. And again, a lot of people think right away, okay, all these people are going to be out of contract. They're going to jump to a <clears throat> WWE or a AEW. I mean, these Two rosters, WWE and AEW, are loaded as it is. I don't know that either one of them has the right. Well, I mean, I don't know if they're going to want to raid the entire Ring of Honor staff to try to bring a whole bunch of talent in with nothing to do with them. I could see MLW going after some of the Ring of Honor talent. I could see the NWA reaching out to the Ring of Honor talent. I could see maybe some places around the world even. I could see a Jay Lethal going and touring the world or the Briscoe brothers touring the world or something like that. Something that they haven't done for a while. Um, but yeah, I don't see immediate jumps there, but uh, getting off topic, I just needed to bring that up. It's a sad moment yeah. for ring of honor because a great company. And uh, I hope that they do get back to operations once uh, they can f- figure things out there. Uh, yeah, moving me, on from me oh, too. Sorry. Yeah, you bet. Uh, from no, I'm there, just agreeing. Yeah. Uh, Tyler Colton was your next pick pop smokes. Um, has he been up to a whole lot since we last talked about this? Not that I've seen just from following on social media. I don't think that Colton has been wrestling maybe even since I'm going to again date this from the time of COVID shutdown. Uh, Tyler Colton, I think, is a bit of a homebody. He likes to stay in Winnipeg. He does most of his matches in Winnipeg, but I don't think he's had many bookings, at least not that I've seen. Um, for doing wrestling since uh, COVID was shut down in the spring of 2020. So I've seen some videos of him uh, uh, doing some intense feats of weightlifting and also some strongman competitions. I don't know if you saw some of those clips of him uh, on the winter road and in in the, on a highway somewhere in Manitoba. And he's, he's got the chains around the neck and he's pulling a semi trailer like (laughs) and stuff like that. So he's always had that interest in uh, strongman things. He is the Canadian Hercules after all. So maybe this is one guy that uh, with the whole shutdown thing that we might have lost a good wrestler. I I really hope not, but uh, he may have just gone on with his other interests at this point. Well, hopefully if he does make any form of return, hey, Tyler Colton, PP-dub, PP-dub. Yeah. Give us a call. Um, My number four pick was uh, another man from the uh, New Zealand scene. This is the shooter, uh, Shane Sinclair. Again, with everything going on with COVID, a lot of the people in Australia and New Zealand did not really have much opportunity for travel or getting out of their own countries. So they've continued to do shows within their countries, but not been able to do a whole lot of traveling. So Shane Sinclair has not really had that opportunity to really push himself forward. But this guy is a great grappler, great ring technician. I think he's got a good look. And I think he would fit in quite well with a lot of the roster we have on PPW already. So again, if he ever does get the opportunity to make his way to Canada, I would really still enjoy seeing Shane Sinclair as a part of the PPW roster. Yeah, and I don't know if those Australian people are going to be making it out anytime soon from from everything I've watched again about the about the COVID restrictions in Australia, boy, are, they're serious about that stuff. And the the when they have a lockdown and stuff, you can't leave your house, man. The cops yeah. are on you. They're beating you up. They're arresting you. They're they're pepper spraying you and stuff. You can't leave your house. You can't leave your city. You can't leave leave your uh, province. So, um, yeah, it's been extremely difficult for those guys down there. Man, if we thought we had it bad here in Canada, they had it twice as bad as that. So uh, I wish the best to Shooter Sinclair and, and, and everybody down in Australia that I hope that we don't lose talents out of this. I, I hope that we don't lose people uh, to, to the COVID shutdown because uh, there would be no way for those guys to train unless you had a ring in your garage or in their backyard or something and uh 
and uh, the, yeah, the, the restrictions have been tremendous over there. So that, that, that really sucks for those guys. And uh, yeah, like I say, I hope that these guys can continue to apply their trade and, and get out of the country to get some more bookings. Yeah. And you know what? New Zealand's the same way too. And they're uh, having <clears> trouble getting their people out and stuff. A lot of restrictions that are similar to those in Australia. And I, you know, I wish the best for everybody there and hope that things do improve. And that again, we'll get to see, uh, people making their way from Australia and from New Zealand over to Canada and all over the world like they should be able to do. Um, from there, we had our last two picks. And uh, again, this one would definitely be, I don't, I, again, is it out of reach? I don't know. Again, it definitely is a dream pick, Papa Smokes, but you had Alexander Hammerstone. I'm going to let you take the take this one away here. Yeah, well, last year or uh, I picked uh, Alexander Hammerstone just as a as a one of the dudes on the MLW roster, he wasn't such a huge big deal back then. He was in the uh, in the dynasty with MJF and Richard Holiday, <clears throat> and um, he was looking good. I mean, he was a heel and such back then, and uh, he he was uh, had the good body and everything. But we've seen him just go uh, so much higher than that since then that uh, his popularity has gained his uh, his bodybuilding gains have been tremendous. And now he's just looked at as a, one of the superstars of the business, regardless of the company he's in. Now we've watched him win the battle riot and defeat uh, the indomitable Jacob Fatu with Contra as the MLW heavyweight champion. So now uh, we've seen Hammerstone rise to the top of the federation that he calls home. I don't think he's going to be knocking on our door anytime soon, but I, I still stand by that pick. I love Hammer, and he's an excellent talent, and uh, I love watching him on TV. I'll have to uh, be happy with that for now, but uh, yeah, not a bad pick. Hey, he turned out to be really something. Our boy Hammer, by the way, he shares the same birthday as me. So, dude, I'm going to shout you out and you better get this. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> My fifth pick was a guy named Slex the Business talking about Australians. Uh, yeah. This guy is the full package. I think this guy could be shot to the moon and back. Um, he started to go over to Ring of Honor and then all the COVID shit started happening. He went back to Australia. He's killing it over there again, but he's now grounded in the Australia area. Hasn't really left there since. And it's unfortunate because this guy is an extreme talent. And again, I think still very obtainable in a PPW ring. I think more people need to see this guy's work. I think that he needs to come on tour and I would love to pick him up in a PPW ring. This guy is exactly what we need in Prairie Pro Wrestling right now. Yeah, and this is one of your Australian picks that I'm a bit more familiar with for sure because uh, I've been watching his uh, stuff on social media and I've watched a few of his matches. A great, great talent. I like Slex a whole bunch. And it was just awful the way it happened that he was making the big jump to the U.S. wrestling with uh, Ring of Honor. He gets over there and just the timing sucked really bad as it did for many people with covid and like we were just talking about Australia, he's got to go back there now. And how the hell are you ever going to get out of there again until all this is finished? They're so strict on their restrictions. And uh, it's just sad. He, he could have been a big deal in ROH all this time. And, uh, and it's just tough to watch uh, talent like that uh, just get denied of their uh, chance and opportunity to make it big. So I'm still pulling for Slex a whole bunch. I like him, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you opened my eyes to this guy. Yeah, he's fantastic, man. Uh, so from here, we're going to talk about the new list, Pop Smokes. It's time for a new top five people that we're picking that we'd like to see in a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring. Again, let me just explain to everybody that we made a rule. Uh, no people from technically from WWE at the moment. I know that, again, we talked about Steph DeLander inevitably signed since the last time we picked her, but no WWE no AEW unless it's someone who kind of is not full-time AEW is kind of maybe made some appearances. We're going more independent level on our workers of choice here. Uh, so I'm going to let you kick it off with your number one pick here, Papa Smokes. Okay. I picked uh, Zenshi from MLW. Anyone that listens to our pod knows that we both like Zenshi a whole bunch. He's used mostly as a, as a lower to middle card guy. 
doesn't get a lot of wins. He's an enhancement talent for the most part. But Senchi, they book him in some big matches because he looks good. He's got that high-flying lucha style, and he's very, very exciting. He's an 11-year vet. He, he hails out of Atlanta, but he went down to Chile and Peru to study uh, South American lucha style down there. Uh, in the U.S., he's been trained by John Gresham to a certain extent. You can't ask for a better trainer than that. And uh, th- I think in the MLW roster, he's not, uh, like I mentioned, he's not a superstar. He's not a top guy there. And he seems to be one of the guys that uh, when other wrestlers come in and they want to make a splash, they have a match against Senshi. And if you can hang with Senshi, then you, you'll probably do okay in that company. He seems to be kind of the gatekeeper type figure of uh, MLW. And uh, you better do well in your match against Senshi if you're going to go any further in that company. Again, would for a local show with PPW, wouldn't Zenchi be extremely exciting? Can you imagine him against Michael Richard Blaze or possibly uh, uh, Michael Allen Richard Clark? I mean, there's all kinds of great matchups you could make with Zenchi and PPW. How do you like that one, Munson? That's an excellent pick. It's our boy Zenchi. And again, one of my favorite moments from this year was watching him jump out of the trees at Filthy Island. This guy surprises us every time. He's so much fun, and I think the crowd here in Saskatoon would absolutely love him. They'd pop hard for the kind of, I mean, dare call it a bit of silliness that he brings to the table, but it's still in seriousness at the same time. He doesn't make it so goofy that it's laughable. He has fun, but he also brings a lot of talent to the table, so I'd love to see him in a PPW ring. Again, I'd love to see you know him get in there, and even like now after we saw the attitude change of the Levi Knight would be an interesting one, or put him in there with Bucky McGraw even and see what we could get out of that one as well too. Um, so many possibilities with Zenshi. You could put him in the ring with just about anybody, and I think no matter what, the fans are going to have an excellent time. So thumbs up, Pop Smokes, great pick. Um, so I'm going to go with my first pick. This one is very, very much a personal pick. Uh, we know I've been doing work with Love Wrestling. I've gotten to know a certain wrestler out of Alberta. His name is Chris Parrish. And uh, I've said it before, I'd love to get him down here, see what he can do in a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring. I think that he would make for an interesting guy that uh, got speed. He's got talent. He uh, could work the great style that a lot of the guys work. He's worked with a lot of people that are already on our Prairie Pro Wrestling roster. I mean, he's even recently worked with Michael Allen, Richard Clark as well, too. So he's very, very familiar with the talent. He's worked with them. I think that would make him very comfortable in a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring. I think he looks comfortable in most wrestling rings that he takes part in. Uh, He's been making a splash over in RCW and places like that right now. And this one is very, very obtainable. And I mean, I put in the good word to PPW management uh, hopefully one day we'll make it happen and we'll see Chris Parrish in a PPW ring. Excellent. Let's do it. And uh, you've spoken highly of Chris Parrish before. I haven't seen too much of his stuff, but uh, I've heard him talk on uh, Sunday brunch before and a couple of the shows on love wrestling seems like a great guy. And I, I'm, I'm always open to having uh, new talent in PPW, especially Western Canadian talent like to keep it homegrown if possible and and get some of our uh, Canadian boys up there in the ring and doing some great stuff. So let's do it. I I hope it happens. You bet, man. Who do you got for your number two pick? Okay. For my number two pick, I have war horse who uh, has been on the independent scene out of St. Louis for, for quite some time for uh, seven or eight years. I think people know him from uh, before his war horse gimmick, uh, he was the guy that uh, they were doing a spot in the corner and uh, Buddy put the little, you know, the little hooks on the turnbuckle, Buddy put it in his mouth and somehow it tore his cheek open. Have you ever seen the, the pictures not. of that? No, I yeah, gotta got to check that out. You know, those uh, hooks in the, on the turnbuckle in the yeah. corner, he got one in his mouth somehow and it ripped his cheek oh, like shit. numerous inches right open. Check that out sometime. Finish the match blood all over the place looking <laughs> horrible and uh that that's what got him noticed for sure being a tough guy like that but anyway I, I warhorse for me again it's not usually my cup of tea he's uh he rides the gimmick pretty hard and uh and uh 
he's he's uh, got some silliness and some fun going on with him but and yet i think he he's got his head on straight about the wrestling business he's got a great finishing move that uh randy savage like elbow drop off the top rope that looks really good he's got the metal music he's got the head banging and stuff i i just picture him at a ppw show our fans would be into it. I, I really think they would. It's a lot of fun. I think, uh, and I'm thinking of him for a live crowd too. Fans seem to like this a lot. And, and I also get and feed off the energy that he gives uh, for all of his uh, matches. And I think it would be a good bit of fun to have uh, the heavy metal war horse in PPW for some matches. How do you feel about that? I do. And as you're saying it, I'm just thinking like, you imagine Michael Allen, Richard Clark coming out to his Pantera theme music, yeah. taking on War Horse. I think this matchup would work perfectly. It would put butts in seats for Prairie Pro Wrestling. Um, it, it would be entertaining. Again, I agree with you. Um, much like a guy like, say, Delhausen, it's exactly the opposite of what I normally would get behind. But yeah, I find it difficult not to like these guys because as goofy as it is, there is still that level of seriousness at times too. And they play it well. <laughs> so especially yeah. Warhorse, I'm looking forward to seeing him in an MLW ring coming up here soon. And a uh, great, excellent pick. I think PPW would be rocking the house if Warhorse got uh, in a PPW ring. Yeah, it's an energy, I think. Hey, just despite uh, the nuts and bolts of what he does in and outside the ring, it's a, it's a feeling, it's an energy. And I really think the fans would attach themselves to that. Couldn't agree more, man. Excellent pick. Uh, my number two pick, hey, this is somebody we interviewed just recently. Our good buddy, Bud Heavy, man. I, I just can't yeah. say enough great things about this guy. We could not do this episode without one of us picking Bud Heavy. I think we both agree on this decision. Uh, we said it to him on the show. If he's ever through Canada, I mean, shit, we'll shell out from our own pocket to put him in a PPW ring if we have to. Because I just want to drink beers and hang out with Bud Heavy. I don't care if he's our DJ, if he's in there going up against somebody on our roster to make them look good or have some fun. I don't care. I want to hang with our boy Bud Heavy and get him in a PPW ring in front of our fans who I think would love the shit out of this guy if he was there. Yeah, I really like this pick, Bob. I'm glad you picked him. Um, what an interview that was. It, it's funny, you know, cold interviewing some of these guys when you've never met them before. What a super nice guy. And he just, he's got his head screwed on straight. A real nice dude. He's down to earth. He uh, has a, a balanced view of the wrestling world. He knows what his place is in it, I think. And he's happy with that. And that that's what, I think fans respond to that too. They, they get his energy that uh, he's not going to be out there in the main events of uh, the big shows and stuff like that. And, and he, he realized that and he's fine with his spot there. And uh, I, I just think Bud Heavy's an awesome guy. And isn't it funny that since we interviewed him, he's, he's getting a little push, a little really tiny is. push on MLW <laughs> because the fans in, at the tapings in Philly have really taken to Bud Heavy and they're chanting his name and stuff. Again, I think it's an energy thing. I think that they just, they, they, they can tell he's a good guy and they can tell he's a good worker and he's trying out there and uh, he's got that beer drinking, fun, loving attitude. And, and I mean, what better for a wrestling fan than a beer drinking and a good fun attitude. Uh, this guy's uh, excellent to me. Yeah, perfect Canadian hero if I ever met one myself. I would love to have him here in Prairie Pro Wrestling. And again, we're going to talk about him more coming up on our MLW Fusion Alpha 6 review, so we'll get back to Bud Heavy. Uh, but back to our picks, Papa Smokes. Number three, who do you got? Well, I got another one of our interview alumni here, uh, Robert Martyr, the stretcher. Awesome. Beautiful. The poisoned youth. Uh, I, uh, another thing, he, he's a very different guy than Bud Heavy, but when we interviewed him, I had not met him or spoke to him before, nor had you. And just what a great guy. He's, he's much more serious than uh, Bud in his approach, but I absolutely appreciate that. He's a, a amateur wrestler turned professional wrestler. And I think he still does do some amateur wrestling. So he's a, he's basically got that shoot style, um, really no gimmick except for just sheer intensity coming to the ring. The guy's a maniac. He wants to win every match. And, and he's also um, young and so, so willing to learn. 
great respect for the past, uh, uh, watches a lot of uh, old stuff that I think is really, really worth watching. Doesn't bog himself down in attitude era stuff. No, he's got the he's got the stars of the 70s and 80s, and he's studying that old school style of catch as catch can wrestling. And uh, it's obviously doing him good because he's cleaning up in some of those uh, Florida promotions at UWFI and uh, and the other ones that he uh, participates in. Uh, he's got he's won belts, he's won little tournaments, and he has convincing looking shoot style matches every time i love robert martyr i i I will always like this guy and i wouldn't be complete if i didn't pick him in this list fuck yeah pop smoke great pick love robert martyr as well too love to see him on ppw ring can you imagine that guy and mitch clark giving an opportunity to go out there and just stretch each other damn it would that be good that'd be awesome yeah would love to see it robert martyr man you're doing excellent work keep it up Brother, we want to see more of it and hopefully eventually in a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring one day. Um, So moving on to my number three here, Pop Smokes, I picked the NWA Women's Champion Camille. I have seen her development with the NWA uh, from, you know, looking kind of green when she started out. But man, she looks like a beast in Amazon, a powerhouse in that ring. But progressively, day by day, she is getting better and better and better inside that ring. She is producing some excellent matches. NWA in power, back-to-back nights, that and NWA 73. She probably just about stole the show two nights in a row, uh, conquering her opponents and working with great women wrestlers as well, too. Camille not only could come to a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring and take on any woman that stepped foot in a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring, I think she could kick the shit out of a lot of the guys on our roster too. And quite frankly, there's a few on there. I wouldn't mind watching her kick the shit out of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we certainly uh, are representing our big muscular women in this list. And I I couldn't agree with that one more. Um, Like you said, NWA kind of brought her along very slowly uh, just as a kind of uh, outside of the ring, uh, supporter or valet kind of thing to Nick Aldis and uh and also uh seconding uh uh Tom Latimer and a few of those other guys but uh I think it's good sometimes to not give her matches right off the bat if she's just learning just let her get out there in front of the camera let her get out in front of the crowd and 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 be ringside for some of these matches and and this the knowledge will soak in eventually as long as she's doing her ring work as well and we can see that she obviously is. Uh, she's a natural athlete. She's one of these six foot tall girls that's just got muscles upon muscles. So being an athlete and looking like an athlete is, is not even an issue to her whatsoever. So you knew that once her uh, ring work was tightened up a little bit, that she had the potential to be a, a, a star in this business. And, and she's really working hard on that right now. So I love this pick and uh, to think of her in PPW. Yeah. The, the booking is unlimited really because she could work with uh, any woman or any man in our company, I think too. You really could. And uh, yeah, like you said, the, the work is it's getting progressively better. The longer it goes, the better she's going to get. So by the time we can get her in a PPW ring, you can imagine we're going to get nothing but gold. It'd be awesome to see. Uh, moving on. What do you got for number four there? Papa smokes. Uh, I got a lady wrestler here too, uh, a veteran, uh, Allison K. Awesome. I've watched her uh, work for quite a long time. She's she's been in wrestling since 2008. She's worked all over the U.S. So so many uh, companies and everything, and I think she's one of these wrestlers that's the complete package. Also, her look is excellent. Her uh, physique is great. Her in-ring skill is quite good. I've never seen her botch anything or uh, have any awkward spots like that in all the matches I've seen. And then her promos are tight as living hell. Like She looks like she should be the person teaching people how to give promos. Very, very well-spoken, uh, uh, well-thought-of and well-liked among the ladies' wrestling community, as far as I can tell. And, uh, yeah, all the companies she's worked for, I mean, she's, she's a complete uh, veteran. Still only at uh, in her early 30s, I think, too. So a lot of years ahead for her. I would just love to have Allison K come and do a, a, a PPW show. Her experience would be uh, very beneficial in the back if she could have a match against uh, uh, 
a female uh, star in our company, it could just be a huge learning experience for that wrestler. And uh, I think her influence would just be tremendous around here. I agree with you. Excellent pick. Allison K is phenomenal. Uh, I don't think I've seen a match of hers that I disliked on, especially not any fault of her own. Again, uh, everything she does is tight from the promos to the in-ring work. She is a phenomenal talent. I'm surprised she isn't with another bigger company or something like that at this point. Again, I keep holding out hope that her and uh, fuck, I'm having a brain fart on her tag team partner's name, right? Marty now. Bell. Thank you, sir. Uh, her and Marty Bell could end up in a match with the Sea Stars on MLW or vice versa, that they could end up taking part in a match in NWA as well, too. That would be awesome. I'd love to see that. Uh, some great talents there. So awesome pick, Bob Smoke. Glad you picked Allison K. Uh, so we're moving on to my number four. And this one, we kind of had a bit of a mention of him earlier in the show. We're talking about Ring of Honor's Gresham. Uh, we're talking about a guy who was the pure wrestling champion over there. This guy is a mat wrestler through and through. Love to watch his work, especially in ROH Pure, which, again, a very underrated part of Ring of Honor that got overlooked during this pandemic and I think could have been a big thing, especially with fans in the arena. Um, Gresham's fantastic. And again, there's just, you could put him in there with just about anybody on our roster and get a good match. But then you start thinking about the possibilities of even getting in there with the ring technicians, like a Mitch Clark or something like that. And again, that stretcher ability comes out and it'd just be phenomenal to see Gresham in a BPW ring. And again, as of right now, sadly, it's a very true possible. Well, again, not sadly, I'd love to get him, but it's sad that he'll be out of contract with the ring of honor. Uh, great for any independent bookings. Uh, if Gresham decides to do a tour anytime soon. So hopefully we could get him in a PPW ring. Yeah, and I love this pick. Uh, and I love the work of John Gresham. He's a magician in there. Like some of his stuff doesn't even look like it's possible. Sometimes he's so fast. His tr uh, transitions from hold to hold, he looks like a blur in there sometimes. He's so tremendously fast and so technical. I love his stuff. Uh, pure style all the way. Um, I think he's a great, great talent. And I think it's uh, possible that he could come around this area because I have seen him live in Saskatoon. I would estimate five years ago for a different company that had a show in Saskatoon here. He was with his girlfriend, Jordan Grace was on that, was on that card also. And um, I wasn't too familiar with either of them at that point. Of course, they didn't have the big names then that they have now, but uh, I remember watching this guy and thinking, my God, like he's putting on a clinic in there. And I, I, I was, I remember thinking, I couldn't call this match because I don't know what the names of half the stuff he's doing even is because I think he invents a lot of it. And it's really spectacular. His speed and his technical ability. Fantastic. This is a great, great pick. He sure would make our uh, jobs as commentators very difficult in calling those matchups for sure. Well, we'd um, sound like we'd have to sound like auctioneers. We'd be calling it so fast. <laughs> the whole time it would be great. Uh, it would take a lot of practice, that's for sure. So, uh, Last but not least here, Pop Smoke, it's time for number five. What do you got for number five here, brother? Okay, I for number five, I got a guy that's also new to me that I've just uh, kind of discovered in the last week or two. And uh, he's not in any major companies, uh, major indie companies yet, but his name is Juicy Finau. And he is a Tongan guy. He's from the West Coast of California. A young guy, 24, and he's, uh, he, again, he looks like one of these, uh, one of the Samoans that we've seen many times throughout uh, wrestling. He's like a Jacob Fatu or an Umaga kind of, he's a big dude, like a really, really big dude. But he's got some, uh, some a few uh, moves that you wouldn't think a guy of his size could pull off. He's been working with uh, GCW as one of his uh, main companies. Uh, he's got uh, a firm training behind him, including a, a nice Canadian touch here too. Uh, one of his trainers was Tony Kazina from Winnipeg, which uh, I've seen a few of his matches as well and uh, a fine wrestler, but uh, known more as a trainer these days. So that's kind of neat. There's a Canadian connection with him as well. And I hear that, MLW might be kind of sniffing around Juicy Finau. Uh, 
um, I could see him easily getting into a contra with Joseph Samael and the guys. He's a beast. Uh, I, I don't know how else to put it. I haven't watched a whole ton of his stuff, but what I've seen has been awesome. And I think this guy's a, still an unknown name, even amongst the indies. He's not very well known yet, but I think he's going to be. This is one of the guys I'm going to keep my eyes on uh, for the next, let's say, year or two. And we'll see where this guy goes, because I think he's going to be good. And I think he's going to be a force to reckon with. What I love about this pick, Papa Smokes, is I have never heard of this guy yet myself, and I've got some research to do after what you've described of him. I am very much looking forward to looking up some matches, checking out his work, and uh, I know that you've got excellent taste in pro wrestling, so I know that I'm going to be in for a treat. Looking forward to looking up his work after we go off the air here tonight. Uh, so my number five, this is definitely a dream one, but again, not absolutely unobtainable. He's in no locked in contract that prevents him from ever coming and working some independent dates. I'd love to see Nick Aldis in a Prairie Pro Wrestling ring. This guy has been phenomenal as the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion up until NWA 73, where he lost the belt finally to Trevor Murdoch. What an amazing run he had with the 16 pounds of gold. Sweet Charlotte there. He held it like a champ. He brings himself across like a champ. His in-ring work is phenomenal. Doesn't miss a spot. Looks great. Gets the best out of his opponents. And again, there, I don't think there's anybody on the roster I wouldn't want Nick Aldis to work with because I just like watching Nick Aldis' work that much. Again, it might be a dream pick, but damn it, would I love if I heard that Nick Aldis was on tour and we could obtain him. Well, that, that's a very interesting pick and a really good one, too. And I've watched uh, Aldis uh, since he was in TNA, I guess, maybe uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, and... Uh, I thought he was pretty good then, but since then he's, he's really made a name for himself in the business. There's nothing overly fancy about his ring style. He looks like, uh, he reminds me of, uh, of a wrestler from the eighties or seventies, nothing fancy, but he gets the job done. Same thing with, uh, when it's gimmick time, like he, he doesn't go for a big gimmick. Uh, we've seen him as the NWA champion. He's got the expensive designer suits, He's got the haircut. He's got everything. He looks great with the belt. And his if he has a gimmick at, at all, it's like a throwback to the uh, territory champions. Uh, the classy guy, the rich guy that co- travels the country defending his title and making big money while he does it. And uh, this would be an awesome guy to have. Yeah, like you say, he'd be pretty versatile. We could put him in there against anybody and have a great match out of it. And, uh, you know, maybe if we were lucky, if he came to PPW, he'd bring Mickey James too. That would be awesome. I mean, that would be a dream come true. I mean, again, I've said it time and time again, not just one of the best female wrestlers in the business, but one of the best in the business period. Um, and you know, I was just thinking as we were talking here, Nick Aldis and Jacob Creed, if we allowed that to go down in the ring, Ooh. chaos would ensue, but damn it. What I love Wapa smokes. And that would be a dream match right there in PPW. That's a great booking idea right there. I love it. So now that we've uh, hopefully not lost the attention of our entire audience with one of the longest episodes of Ring Respect Radio in history, it's time for what we do best. Talking about MLW Fusion Alpha Pop Smokes Alpha Episode 6. We're taping this on a Tuesday. 7 obviously drops tomorrow night. Uh, This episode of ring respect radio likely to drop on friday or saturday so again by that time obviously episode seven will have dropped but let's talk about episode six and again before we even start man this was a very interesting episode of mlw fusion driving storylines forward and a lot to pack into this one hour episode of wrestling action i started off with a uh, backstage thing caesar duran in his office or his whatever we could call it, somewhat of an office, a little bit of a den there, uh, but it looks fantastic. It, yeah, that too. Uh, but it looks great for what he's doing and what's going yeah. on there. Um, he's sitting there with the National Open Weight Championship, and he has an idea. Um, he wants to make a miracle of violence, as he calls it, and an opportunity for people on the MLW roster. We are going to have some form of a match, I believe, again, For those out there who know already, the match has been announced through uh, social media and stuff like that. But at the time of this recording of MLW Fusion Alpha 6, I don't believe that they quite announced what that matchup is. 
but there will be a matchup fusion on Thanksgiving, which again, for our Canadian fans is going to be taking place here this month for our friends in the United States. Uh, so fusion on Thanksgiving, we are going to crown a brand new MLW national open weight championship champion, Papa Smokes. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this. This title was held so brilliantly by Alexander Hammerstone. I want to see where the company goes next with the national open weight championship. I mean, damn big, 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 big shoes to fill when it comes to being the second one to hold that championship after hammer. Yeah. Yeah. And in this uh, promo too, we also saw uh, Cesar Duran speak to Mil Muertes. And yes. I thought this was an interesting part too, is that, uh, Duran asked the, the rhetorical question, what will men do for gold? And, and uh, once he talked to uh, Mil Muertes, he, he kind of gave it the old, well, you've got the Caribbean championship now, and now are, you have to fill your end of the bargain, and there must be a sacrifice. So this is very, uh, very foreboding words from uh, Caesar Duran. It gives the whole impression that that Muertes' victory for the Caribbean Championship was kind of a setup by Duran and Muertes, and uh, now now that uh, Muertes has got what he wants, he's got to sacrifice something to uh, to Caesar Duran, and Duran hands Muertes the ornate box, and tells him to look inside, and then Muertes looks inside, and there's a light coming out of it. I don't know what's going on here. It, it's very interesting, though. But we've seen this little... Um, since the days of Selena De La Renta appearing there, she had the kind of supernatural uh, Latin American witchy kind of thing going on or supernatural kind of angle going on. It it's, uh, looks like Duran is continuing that, too, with the kind of... Uh, yeah, just the little angle of the supernatural going on here, too, with this... Uh, perhaps a magic box of some kind, but it's it's certainly going to signify some kind of uh, wrestler that Muertes is going to have to uh, eliminate for Duran, or he's going to have to do some sort of a favor for Duran. And when he calls it a sacrifice, well, it sounds very foreboding. So uh, very interested to see where this is going to lead. You bet. And I have some thoughts on it as well, too. Again, I'm a little bit more familiar with the Lucha Underground days and what went on over there. And this feels very familiar to opportunities that sometimes that AKA Dario Cueto, now Cesar Duran would give out to wrestlers and stuff like that, that did favors for him or won them in a matchup and stuff like that. It almost seems like King Muertes might have to sacrifice something like that Caribbean championship and that box of sorts will have some sort of medallion or something that will have a rich history to lucha wrestling and stuff like that, or to certain ruins that are found in Mexico and everything like that. It, it ends up very story driven to the Mexican culture and stuff like that. And the opportunity may be an opportunity for that MLW national open weight championship. The sacrifice might be the Caribbean championship in the process. We'll have to wait and see, but again, great storytelling here. I like what I see and, King Mortez, I mean, we've said it a million times. Fantastic. Looking forward to whatever they've got going for this guy. Yeah, visually, Mortez looks so good, too. He's perfect for a spot like this because he's so scary to look at. His body is massive. He's got that scary-looking mask and those uh, contact lenses in, and, and he looks great. And, and this is a guy that uh, might not have got so much of a chance in some other companies, but in the way that they're featuring him in MLW, he's an absolute monster. And uh, I like where they're going with this and I'm anxious to see more. Yeah. Damn straight. Can't wait. Uh, so we went to wrestling action right after this. This is a opening round match in the opera cup 2021 tournament. Uh, we get the second match from Mr. Lee Moriarty, who we saw take on Calvin Tankman recently. And he was taking on the debuting Bobby Fish. This was an interesting matchup, to say the least. Um, now, wow, can't believe the pop the Fish got there from the. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised by the pop. But again, coming from being a heel character over in NXT to coming over and getting an immediate pop from the fans, maybe not surprising. But again, definitely couldn't play the heel in this one as a result. Uh, they were all chanting undisputed to him. They were chanting, let's go, Bobby. Let's go, Lee. The fans definitely were heavily into this one. And again, 
Bobby Fish shows just how much he can get out of a guy. He really made Lee Moriarty work for it. Again, Lee Moriarty showing more signs again of that high flying and some of the new style of work. But when he gets grounded with a guy who can bring him down to that level, he really does put in a decent matchup. There was some solid work here. And I, overall, I enjoyed this matchup. Fish got the win by tap out, uh, advanced to the next round. Again, Lee Moriarty was not made to look uh, like a chump in this by any means. Uh, Fish took him to a quite a lengthy opening round matchup here and uh, barely edged out the win. Lee, uh, on a few occasions, looking like he was going to pick up the win over Bobby Fish. So again, they're really strongly featuring and pushing Lee Moriarty without having to give him immediate wins. Again, Bobby Fish is a star. You kind of want to put his name into the next round of the Opera Cup tournament as well, too, to keep eyes on that. Again, a lot of people know who Bobby Fish is, so it draws them into the MLW crowd. Uh, I like this great opening matchup for this episode of Fusion. Pop Smokes, your thoughts? Yeah, I also liked it. And uh, to see Fish get a reaction like that, not surprising, but also good uh, and this is uh, the, the thing about uh, smaller companies that get a guy fresh from a big company such as Bobby Fish is that he's already a name and everybody knows him from watching him on TV. So his very first match with MLW, he can come out to a big pop, uh, all kinds of people chanting his name, knowing him, knowing his style, knowing what to expect and what they want to see. This is good stuff. And Fish came in and he gave it everything he had to and this was a really good match. Uh, Fish, we all know what his style is like, very martial arts influenced. He's coming in with strikes, coming in with leg kicks, controlling with uh, martial arts, striking for the for several minutes throughout this match. Uh, he worked Moriarty's legs relentlessly, especially with those kicks to the back of the thigh. Lee Moriarty selling this quite nicely too. And then I like the way this match turned out with the layout too, because uh, you could see the psychology working in this match. Fish going after the legs, weakening them with kicks, was taking away a lot of Moriarty's possible offense. This uh, the aerial moves that he likes to use, stuff where he's leaping off the ropes, but also landing on his two feet was hurting that 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 left leg that Fish kept kicking and. Uh, you could see uh, Moriarty weakening throughout this match just a little bit, even though he's got so many tricks up his sleeve. Fish, uh, with the psychology of this match, just had him with the leg kicks and all that. Couldn't get the offense off. And then uh, eventually locking in the heel hook or the uh, fish hook, as he likes to call it, uh, very quickly with that injured leg, Moriarty taps out and... Uh, now we've got uh, Fish advancing in the Opera Cup. He's going to have to fit. He's going to have to face Davy Richards in the next round. So, wow, this is already going to be a fantastic match in that semifinal round. Bobby Fish versus Davy Richards. Can't wait, man! It is going to be fantastic. So, great match up there. Uh, from there, we went to a promo backstage. Uh, where EJ and Duca is being interviewed there out in a parking lot uh, saying about, you know, Hammer seems like a solid dude. It's why he wants to help him out. He wants nothing to do with Contra other than to kick their ass and take them out. But then he throws a little wrench in the plan saying <clears throat> that maybe Hammer will return the favor to him and give him an MLW World Heavyweight Championship match after the War Chamber. Again, does this put a little bit of dissension to Hammer's team when EJ and Duca very much eyeing up that golden prize that's around the waist of Alex Alexander Hammerstone. Yeah. And it's just uh, the MLW bookers just basically planting a seed that will grow later. You know, it, it's something that will stick in the back of our minds. Just that one little comment, even though he's shown himself to be an ally of Hammerstone so far, that one little comment is just, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll be able to get a championship match out of him. That just got everybody thinking, and that seed is planted now. So the, it begs the question, can we even trust EJ and Duca for War Chamber, or, or is he kind of playing a game of uh, subterfuge? Is he uh, going to work on Hammerstone from the inside, kind of learn some stuff about him, and then maybe try and play him for that championship? As we all know, in, in all kinds of sports, but especially wrestling, when you're sitting on top of the mountain with that championship gold around your waist, 
you can't trust anybody because everybody wants what you've got. So this is interesting. As much of a popular face as Nduka is, it just raises that slight bit of doubt as to whether he can be trusted. You bet, man. So we'll have to wait and see and find out. But from there, we went to a promo featuring Kelvin Tankman. Everybody's been asking the question, is Tankman looking to join up with King Mo and Alex Kane? We've been talking about this for weeks. Tankman making it very clear in this promo he has no interest in working with King Mo and Alex Kane. In fact, he even makes the comment that, if anything, they wish that they could hop on Tankman's bandwagon as opposed to him jumping on theirs, that he they need him more than he needs them kind of thing from there king mo alex kane appeared and they were none too happy with the comments from out calvin tankman king mo throwing a, i believe it was a right hook there to tankman taking him out what a right hook it was too and then from there what proceeded to be a stabbing of the eye or some part of the face of calvin tankman uh the two run off and a, uh, an official a medical official comes into the room he's looking after tankman there is blood seeping into that cloth that he's got over tankman's face and what i really loved the night the icing on the cake here with this segment is the guy calling for backup and help which a lot of companies don't seem to do it's random camera guys sitting around doing nothing and random this random that in this case he's somebody get some fucking help in here and i believe he actually used those exact words get some fucking help in here i love that that was perfectly well played by the health official in this segment uh great segment i love this we've been speculating about the possibility of alex kane taking somebody out to sneak his way further into the opera cup tournament as he's a standby and i think it's starting to unfold right before our eyes now pop smokes yeah you were right all along months and you had this theory that uh they've never really announced uh, uh backups for the opera cup before alternates in case of injury this year, they did announce that Alex Kane would be a backup because he was pissed that he wasn't in the Opera Cup seating uh, uh, along with the other guys. So uh, this is the perfect way to get him in there. And uh, this may have been the American top team's plan all along is just to uh, to eliminate somebody from contention to get Alex Kane in there, obviously with the thought that he might be able to suplex his way to the Opera Cup championship. So very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, we got to send our thoughts and prayers out to Tankman to hopefully his yeah. eyeballs. Okay. Yeah, you bet. I don't know what they took out. It looked like an eyeball, but again, it did not look pretty. It was, it was a pretty crazy segment. I got to say a lot of blood in this one. So definitely interesting yeah. there from MLW. You don't see that a lot, uh, but they use the spot. Well, in this case, I uh, love to see it. Uh, from there, the, this was a little bit of fun. We had Los Parks doing a Halloween-themed promo, talking all sorts of trash about gringos and Halloween and everything like that. I, this was a nice break from the seriousness we just saw. Again, a little bit of fun can be good on a wrestling program, and MLW does know how to use it properly a lot of the time. And, and I love Los Parks. This was fantastic. I love them beating the shit out of that guy towards the end of the promo and stuff like that, beating him down in the streets. Damn it, Thomas, folks. I, I, I chuckled, but I had fun with this and still it had a level of serious, <clears throat> seriousness to it that didn't take away from the champs. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on that, too. This is one of the things I like about MLW also is uh, – since the COVID era when travel has become uh, a little bit more difficult and stuff like that, um, they will, they still have their talent do promos from wherever they are and send them in kind of thing. You could see yeah. that Los parks were somewhere in Mexico, maybe where they live. And uh, yeah, they, they got on the suits and, uh, and get back to business and cut a promo or a little segment or a little skit, whatever you want to call that for uh, MLW and send it in and, and that way their names are still out there. They don't actually have to be at the taping to uh, have their names there and, and make an impact on this show. They can send it in from uh, wherever they are until they get back. And uh, we get to hear from uh, La Parca or L.A. Park and, and his sons, uh, the tag team champions. And uh, it just keeps their name fresh, keeps it on everybody's mind and uh, gives us a little chuckle in the meantime. It sure does. Great segment there. Uh, from there, we had another backstage segment. It was Cesar Duran. Uh, I don't know about summoning, but asking Mods Kruger to meet with him in this case, uh, saying that uh, Mods Kruger didn't need to 
you know, be summoned. He should be able to do as he pleases and stuff like that. Uh, Cesar Duran saying that he really likes uh, the missionary that uh, Mods Kruger is, the violence that he inflicts and stuff, and said that basically his job with Contra should be over, that Fatu had already fallen, and that Mods Kruger needs to continue doing something that Mods Kruger does best, and that's going out there and hurting people. It almost sounded like Cesar Duran trying to earn Mods Kruger's trust over to his side and maybe even pulling him away from Joseph Samael and Contra at the same time. Uh, it could cause a lot of hostility there between Contra and Cesar Duran as well, too. Uh, curious to see how this plans out. Mods Kruger very clear at stating that his job is not done. He still needs to take out Alexander Hammerstone, and the mission remains the same. Hail Contra. Yeah, and he, yeah, like you say, he made it very clear, uh, Kruger did, that his mission has never changed. It's always been to destroy Alexander Hammerstone. That's it. Nothing else. No belts, wins, title shots. None of that stuff matters. His only goal is to destroy Hammerstone, even after Fatu has already fallen and lost that belt. And uh, yeah, uh, Kruger not swaying at all from his mission uh, and ending the whole promo with a good series of hail contra. So there's no uh, there's no question as to where his allegiances lie, and uh, Duran will have to uh, keep that in mind. Whatever his plans are for Mods Kruger, I I think he's going to have a hard time swaying him away from uh, the evil reach of Contra. Sure will, but we're going to see him in action coming up here right away. Uh, they made an announcement about yeah, Warhorse coming to MLW, so that was quite the yeah. interesting little video that they had pop up. Uh, looking forward to seeing that. They have a lot of new people coming in, especially coming up on November 6th at the next Philly tapings here, so a lot to unpack here in MLW. I mean, we got Warhorse coming in. We've got Enzo coming in. Um, I, I, I'm drawing a blank, but I know there's at least one or two other signings that are joining them. Oh, sorry. Homicide, I believe was another one as well, too. Yeah. Uh, he's going to be, I believe working with Enzo, if I'm not mistaken, or, or else it's Enzo working with Alex Shelley or something like that coming up at the tapings, but we'll leave that for when that actually airs. Um, and there was a new, new signing again too. somebody I'm not very familiar with, and I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but also going to be debuting in Philly. So a lot to unpack coming up here at the next round of tapings and looking forward to being able to talk about all these guys uh, coming up when they do make their uh, debuts. Well, and they've also released a few stars too. We know we were talking about that uh, filthy Tom Lawler just finished up with them. And I just noticed that uh, Jordan Oliver also was released by uh, MLW just in the last day or two. Kind of a surprise. He's been a uh, mainstay there for a long time too, but uh, a modern wrestling company, you got to keep it fresh, I guess. And uh, we don't know what the backstage uh, happenings are or anything else like that, but kind of sorry to see Jordan Oliver go. Uh, uh, I thought he had a lot of potential for a young guy too, but, we don't know what's going on in behind the scenes and all that. And, and uh, with fresh talent coming in, uh, the, you can't keep everybody and uh, you got to keep a balance going. So uh, some of the uh, mainstays have to go too, and that's just the way the business is. So in with the out, in with the new and out with the old, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure what the announcement is there truly, but again, all the best to Jordan <clears throat> Oliver. Maybe he's found uh, something else that we're going to see him join up with soon too. So we'll wait to see how his career unfolds. <coughs> oh. So from there, after that announcement, uh, I guess the camera guy or this announced guy that they've got backstage, uh, Sparks, I believe is his last name there. He goes back for an interview with Willow Nightingale, who's at a, a signing or a merch table backstage. I goes and talks to her about the beatdown that she got from Holodead. She is wearing a pair of protective shades over her eyes, saying that, you know, she was attacked, uh, beaten down. And she starts to get very frustrated as she's being asked about Holodead here. So you can tell the animosity that was built from the attack from the last episode of MLW Fusion. She gets, she asks for a short moment and she gets on the phone, calls up Cesar Duran and gets a match booked, Willow Nightingale versus Holodead. And man, I didn't think it was coming this soon, but apparently this one is going to happen pretty quick here for MLW. And I got to say, I'm looking forward to seeing where they go with Holodead and Willow Nightingale. Yeah, and the, we kind of have to wonder if that was the original plan to uh, taking into account the injury to Nicole Savoy on the last uh, episode of the taping as well. And uh, not, not sure uh, uh, the status 
her status as for a return, but uh, at any rate, we've got uh, All the Dead versus Willow Nightingale. This is going to be a good program, I think. Uh, the more or less the featherweight division's top heel and top babyface clashing uh, this soon. Uh, this soon in the uh, just the genesis of the uh, featherweight di ladies division there. So this is good. I think it's smart to have a couple of big matches right off the bat and get 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 your stars out there having big matches with each other and so that the uh, fans get their eyeballs on your product and, and think it's legit and good. So I these two ladies can handle it. Yeah, you bet. Looking forward to that one. And speaking of a holiday, up next, she was leading Dr. Dax to the ring. We just asked last time on the show whether or not we are ever going to see Dr. Dax in the ring. And God damn, the poor bastard going out there and having to take on Mods Kruger in this opening matchup yeah. for himself on MLW. He got absolutely squashed by Kruger. And the power of Mods Kruger lifting up a guy the size of Dr. Dax there to finish him off and just without any remorse, Mods Kruger what might what ah, wipes the floor with Dr. Dax in his debut. Um not a whole lot we can unpackage from that. Mods Kruger looks fantastic. He looks more like a monster, especially beating a guy the size and I, I guess the look too of Dr. Dax. Yeah, yeah. The Dr. Dax, not a small guy. Looks like he's got to be uh, north of 300 pounds somewhere. And uh, But Kruger just having no part of it whatsoever and uh, he's a killing machine. He's a monster. He gave him that finish. I don't know the name of it, but it's a uh, it, God, that, that looks like a very dangerous move with the uh, front kind of splash down on the front uh, of the uh, of the victim of the move. And it's just absolutely destructive. But uh, And then he uh, hit a promo after the match and, again, just aligning himself strongly with Contra, giving it the Hail Contra uh, chant, which the crowd wasn't having at all. And then... Uh, then a little treat for the crowd. Do you want to uh, elucidate what happened next, Munson? Well, I mean, he was saying there was no one back there that could challenge him. So, lo and behold, Bud fucking Heavy comes on out, and he's, he's bringing a little insurance policy with him. He grabs a steel chair from the backstage area. He's going to go take on Mods Kruger once again. We talked about this with him on the show, being across the ring from Mods Kruger. And again, uh, Bud Heavy's just one of those boys that uh, you get enough beers in him. He's got no fear in him whatsoever. He went right out there with the intent to try to take Kruger out. Unfortunately for our Bud, Bud Heavy, he took a shit kick. And once again, and man, did he take a shit kick in the, the mods Kruger hammer in that chair into the face of Bud Heavy. Bud Heavy goes down hard and that devastating finisher maneuver on Bud Heavy finishes him off. Mods Kruger picking up two easy victories on this night of MLW. But I'm glad to see Bud Heavy again. I don't care in what fashion he's on the show. Week after week, I'm I'm popping every time I see Bud Heavy on my screen. And he was over with that Philly crowd again, too. That's a good thing. And and as we talk to him in our interview, sometimes you, you can't predict what the crowd is going to like and wh what they're going to get behind. And they just like the look of Bud Heavy maybe as an underdog kind of thing. But the same thing when he came out for this match, it was immediate. Just the Bud, 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 Bud chance. And I'm loving it, man. Just It's one thing to be enhancement talent, but when the, the crowd gets behind you and, and sees something in you, that's got to be a great feeling. And, and MLW obviously going with this and, and giving him the chance to get out there and, and show a bit of his stuff. And giving the crowd uh, something to chant for. And uh, I mean, it didn't go Bud Heavy's way. I'm sure it didn't go the way he wanted it to. But uh, again, he got out there. He had the spotlight on him for a big match with one of Contra's, uh, well, not a match, I guess, but a confrontation against one of Contra's top guys too. And one of the most feared guys in the company. And uh, Bud just, he, he knows his uh, job. He knows to get out there and, uh, and challenge him and uh, and see what you can do. And, and yeah, it didn't go his way, but he's out there and, and he's getting over with the fans. I'm so happy about it. I think he got screen time. So I think in the end, it did go Bud's way one way or another. He might be For a sure. crazy, crazy SOB, sure. but he's a fantastic SOB at the same time. Loved every bit of it. Hoping he's going to be back out again in the coming weeks on MLW. Bud Heavy, rock on, brother. 
Uh, from there, we had a promo from 5150. And again, these guys week after week starting to become one of my favorite parts of the MLW programming. And a great, wonderful promo from these boys. Uh, now they're putting down the challenge. They've taken out Injustice. They want the belts. They're calling out Los Parks. And man, I didn't know it was going to be a 5150 Los Parks thing. And maybe it won't still. I'm not too sure how it's going to pan out. Um, you know, I think Ross and Marshall still have a claim to that MLW championship tag team gold there as well, too. But interesting to see the 5150 claiming like we took out two of your best boys and stuff like that. I mean, as according to what they did, Oliver on the shelf completely. And yeah, I mean, they're a strong team looking great. And I'm not against them being in the tag title picture in MLW at all. Yeah, and as we've discussed on this podcast in the last couple episodes, we knew that 5150 would want to challenge for those tag team titles at some point, but we weren't sure if they would do a, a heel versus heel program with Los Parks right off the bat or anything, or we we were kind of waiting to see what the who would match up with who for some of these feuds. We thought maybe 5150 might go against the Von Ericks for sort of a number one contender spot or something, but no. They've made it clear that uh, they're not interested in anyone except Los Parks because of that tag team gold. So um, I I would expect that they're going to sign this match at some point. And uh, this is very interesting. This will be a brawl and uh, and a really good match. Uh, and and I'm I'm excited for it. And uh, I could I'm not sure, but I could see them putting the gold on fifty one fifty at some point too. And uh, and we'll see what happens with that, but we're going to have some wild matches in the meantime. Well, and just think, Los Parks, a lot of the time during their title run and before that, had the one-man advantage in a lot of their matches. This time around, they don't necessarily have a one-man advantage. They're at a one-man disadvantage because 5150, two guys at ringside, two inside the ring. Again, that third uh, member of Los Parks is going to have to watch out because he's going to have two sets of eyeballs on that ringside area, and they might not be able to pull off the same dirty tricks that they have in the past in order to obtain and uh, keep their tag team title belts. So, yeah, looking forward to that. It should be fantastic. Um, speaking of promos, though, we had another one. And again, this one was of the comedy sorts, but it was pulled off extremely well. I got to say Richard holiday after getting the beat down from King Muertes and Contra last week, he is bandaged up all over his face to the point where he can't even speak. Uh, he's backstage with Alicia Toot and Alexander Hammerstone making an attempt to cut a promo about war chamber, but apparently something that holiday said that we couldn't quite understand, but kind of came across a little bit like Kenny on South park where Alicia apparently understood and Hammer understood, but the rest of us didn't quite understood. He uh, ate a slap from Alicia too, saying that that was inappropriate. And then even Alexander Hammerstone said, dude, we can't say that we're on national television here or whatever. Very comical, but not stupid comedy at the same time. This was pulled off well by all members and everything. Um, even Alicia too, I think did some of her finest work in this segment, uh, hitting that slap at the perfect time and everything. I, I like this one. Yeah, I thought it was okay. Uh, I was a little bit confused at first as to what was going on, as to why Holiday looked like the invisible man there with his uh, <laughs> face wrapped up and his shades on and everything. And and uh, yeah, I was mildly confused by this, but uh, uh, still a good little spot. And uh, uh, Hammer and Holiday are pretty funny together. And then uh, Alicia's kind of getting uh, a lot more screen time too doing a great job of being the backstage interviewer. And uh, now they're starting to involve her in angles a little bit too. And I, I think she does it well. She performs nicely. And this was a funny little bit. Yeah, it sure was. I mean, and it didn't take up a lot of TV time either. So it was a nice little thing to kind of break up things. And right before we got to the main event, we finally got to hear from Enzo himself, who's going to be making his MLW debut here right away. Um, got on there. He said that he wanted to join MLW. He showed that he had MLW playing up on his TV screen. He wants to get in there, work with some of the best in the business, that he's got a lot of guys that he wants to get in there with and take care of. 
Oh, this is going to be fantastic. I mean, this is going to put eyes on MLW first and foremost. Enzo is going to annoy the shit out of people on the microphone. There is a lot of wrestling fans who absolutely detest this guy. And I think I like him more the, that I hear people detesting him because he is doing exactly what he needs to be doing. And I'm looking forward to this. I mean, again, we've said it before, his in-ring style, nothing flashy about it but he gets the job done and he carries himself so well on the microphone. And he's such a personality at the same time that he stands out like a sore thumb and he's going to be great for the MLW crowd. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, Again, this isn't the kind of wrestler that I would normally like, I think, but he caught my eye when he was in uh, Vince's company a couple of years ago. And uh, just through his ridiculous promos and, and, He's got a good thing going there. And yeah, like you say, he's a, he's kind of a controversial character and uh, he will get eyes on the MLW product when he comes in. People will be curious as to what he's up to and what, and how they're going to book him and what he'll be up to. And I, I could see him being uh, maybe one of the front runners to challenge for the uh, middleweight title or maybe even that uh, national openweight title. Yeah, you bet. And, you know, speaking quickly on the uh, middleweight championship, uh, there was an announcement just recently that Tajiri is going to be defending that championship at an all Japan pro wrestling show. And that was part of the reason for Tajiri's big win at Fightland was to be able to carry that over and start that connection between MLW and all Japan pro wrestling as well, too. So great to see that the MLW titles are being defended outside of MLW as well. It brings that international flavor and hopefully brings in some of the fans that have tuned into All Japan that can now tune into MLW as well, too. Uh, moving on from there, though, our main event of the evening, it is another opening round of the 2021 Opera Cup. TJP, who I believe has been putting on some phenomenal shows as of late, and again, another controversial figure, bring up his name in, in the uh, wrestling community lately, and you're pretty much going to get a bunch of eyes rolling, talking about uh, him as a person outside of pro wrestling, which, again, I think people need to stop worrying about wrestlers' personal lives and start worrying about what they're doing inside of the ring. We never used to be able to pry into their personal lives and know what they were like. We saw what they did on TV, and that's what we had to base it on. I think this whole world of social media has killed that quite a bit, and I think that uh, a lot of people need to stay off social media and stop worrying about what people's personal thoughts are. Just my opinion, I guess, but I'm looking forward to another TJP match personally myself. Uh, against Alex Shelley. And I'm going to ask before we even talk about this one, had you seen or heard of Alex Shelley much prior to this night here in MLW? Yeah, yeah, quite a lot. Um, When I first started watching um, TNA wrestling, uh, I had had a period like, like I think some wrestling fans had in the early 2000s where I was kind of like, a little bit disenchanted with the products on TV and I stopped watching for a while. But when I came to back to watching, I decided to watch TNA in somewhere, I don't know, let's say 2006 or seven kind of thing. Uh, Alex Shelley was one of the uh, talents that immediately jumped out to me on, on TNA impact back then. Um, He was later to be in the tag team, the motor city machine guns with Chris Saban, but Alex Shelley is just an absolutely fantastic talent. Uh, he's he's such a good technical wrestler. He's got a great mind for the business and for psychology. So I, I've actually always liked this guy. He's got a lot of charisma too. He's from Detroit and he's done uh, a lot of work up in uh, Toronto and Windsor, Ontario and all that stuff too. So he has that Canadian connection too. And uh, there's not much more I can say about that. It's just that he caught my attention from when I first saw him, uh, let's say, 15 years ago uh, in, in TNA, and, and he's still around. He still looks good. He looks the same pretty much as he did back then, and I'm sure he's got a, a lot of bumps on his bump card, but you watch this match months, and uh, you can see the technical uh, expertise of him, especially when in there with another technical expert such as TJ P- uh, Perkins, so uh, uh, th- this this when I saw that this was going to be the main event tonight, what a treat! I don't know uh, how much Alex Shelley is going to be staying in MLW or if he's just doing a couple of shots for now. But uh, glad to see him in there with TJP. And didn't we get a just a rousing, excellent main event to this show? 
Yeah, you bet we did. Um, again, I'm you probably a little bit more familiar with Alex Shelley than I, I am. I, I had seen some of his stuff. So I was <clears> somewhat <throat> familiar, but not maybe as much as you were. Um, the promo that he did before the match, I liked. It was pretty simple. Like he's asked what was on his mind going into this, and he said nothing. And that's how you know that you got yeah. the right mind for this. You can't worry about what's going to go on. You got to go out there. You got to feel it, and you got to get the job done. I loved it. His music hit. He leaves the promo. He comes straight out. And again, a great technical match with these two guys. Excellent work from both guys. TJP finally picking up a win in MLW, although be it uh, he used the ropes to get that win over Alex Shelley. But again, that makes Shelley look good at the same time. Uh, TJP having to use that leverage in order to get a victory over him. And again, if Shelley's run is short lived, that's okay. But at the same time, I'd love to see him stick around. I think there's a lot of great things, a lot of mileage the MLW could get out of him. And I believe that there is uh, something planned for him at the next tapings in Philly as well, too. So again, I'm glad to know that even despite a loss here, we're going to see more from Alex Shelley and MLW. I think he fits beautifully onto this roster. Uh, I was happy to see TJP go through to the, on the upper cup as well, too. Uh, everything about this just screamed great main event. I loved it. Uh, great work from both men. Excellent night of MLW overall. I don't think I had a boring moment to this entire night. This was a great episode, MLW Fusion Alpha Episode 6. Yeah, agreed. And and for me, this main event was really the icing on the cake. It was it was a great match. And uh, the way it was laid out was just perfect, too. As a lot of the matches are in MLW, that's what I like about them so much. They don't come out with the slug fest and the trading of forearms and stuff. It's wrestling. They lock up. They they jockey for advantage. There's takedowns. There's roll throughs. There's reversals. There's wrist locks, hammer locks, all kinds of holds and and everything. Shelley uh, put on a nice abdominal stretch in the middle of this match, which mm-hmm. which I love to see. One of those holds that used to be such a staple in wrestling, and then it's just not used that much anymore. Um, I have it in my notes here. These two guys are wrestlers in big letters. Uh, This is professional wrestling here without all the hoo-ha, without any comedy, without uh, ridiculous drama that doesn't make any sense in the psychology of the match. This was just a great tournament match. And I love it. And uh, I'm just liking TJP's work even more and more. He looks like the veteran is similar to what Alex Shelley is. He's probably been in the business as long as Alex Shelley too. In fact, I think TJ Perkins was in TNA in the period I'm talking about. He was playing the masked wrestler suicide. If you remember that, uh, and everybody was wondering who suicide was because he was such an aerial expert and such a great technical wrestler. Uh, I didn't know who TJ Perkins was back then, but I knew suicide. Well, now we got, TJP and he's he's one of my favorites man he he makes it look so easy his movements are smooth and fluid did you see the little set where he had uh, kind of a head scissors on Alex Shelley just with his ankles and then he would twist the body and send Alex uh, somersaulting and careening off into the corner a couple of times with that nice move I mean it, that's kind of a weird move. It kind of doesn't look like you could do uh, that to someone for real and have that actual result happen. But TJP makes it look real, makes it look legit, like a guy could actually do that stuff. And then Alex Shelley with his great selling, this was just awesome stuff. Shelley went after TJP's arm for a lot of that match. And I, I like those I like the psychology of that in a match, and I like the way it uh, plays out where they center in on a body part and just work it, work it, work it, and it causes a tension in the viewer's mind of just what's going to happen with this. Is he going to have any use of that arm for the last bit of the match? Will he be able to do his finish with the an arm that's been worked that much? It makes sense, and it makes it look like a real struggle and a real match, and that's what I appreciate about a lot of these MLW matches is their sporting style. They make it look real. They make it look like an actual struggle, and therefore the viewer can believe that this this is a match that each competitor is trying to win. And this is honestly officially now two times that TJP has really stolen the show in the main event level for 
uh, MLW as of late. I mean, again, he continues to just create great wrestling and that's what we love seeing. So overall, what a great night of MLW action. You would think that, you know, a mat, uh, an hour show with all that greatness that was building couldn't be topped, but that main event topped it, put the icing on the cake. Phenomenal show. I love this episode. Probably one of the best overall episodes of MLW Fusion Alpha, and that is saying a lot because they've been kicking some major ass there. Uh, so I loved it, Pop Smokes. Any last thoughts on MLW Fusion? No, but I, I loved this episode also. I thought it was very strong, mostly because the matches were strong. But good stuff behind the scenes, too. And then I just wanted to remind our fans also that for the Opera Cup seedings now, now we're at the state where we've got uh, the semifinals. It's going to be Davey Richards versus Bobby Fish and TJP versus Calvin Tankman to get to that final matchup for the Opera Cup. So that's the way the seeding has gone. Tankman, obviously a question mark at this point, but this is where the seedings have gone. And when you look at the four competitors that are left in this, I mean, each one of them is entirely able of... Uh, uh, entirely suitable to win the uh, opera cup such a it's becoming a prestigious prize in professional wrestling once again as it had been earlier in the 20th century and now we've got these four superstars in mlw going for it and it, it, i'm very very excited for this i'm so glad they brought the opera cup back and i think it's a huge feather in the cap for the company to have a prestigious old and historical trophy like that that the guys will do anything to win nowadays. You bet, man. I'm loving every bit of it. And again, those four competitors, uh, again, it's hard to predict at this point where things are going to go. And it doesn't matter at this point either, too, because the real winners are us as the fans get to witness it going down. But yeah, that was MLW Fusion Alpha 6. And this has been another great episode, a very long episode, but glad to have done it. Didn't feel like we missed a beat here tonight, Pop Smokes of Ring Respect Radio. Uh, again, thank you everybody, not only for tuning into the show, but again, for the support at PPW's Part 5, A New Beginning. Uh, check out our matches that we have up on YouTube and eventually we'll be getting some matches from PPW Part 5 up on YouTube eventually as well too. <laughs> and we'll be happy to be on the commentary team for that. Uh, continue to support local wrestling, continue to support MLW and all the independents out there as well too. And continue to just enjoy professional wrestling as it should be enjoyed from myself and pop smokes thanks for tuning in once again have a great night and take care when you go to the old saloon at the dead south end gonna find you a man there wants to be your friend if you dare to deny his wish you'll be dead by Come on.